Okay. So tonight we're talking about uh, Faces of Literacy, our event in October and the storytelling project that goes along with it. Um, so some of you, I don't know if anyone was here last year. Um, did anyone participate in 2020 or watch the, yep. yeah. So Linda, if you wanna be our, our resident expert and share any advice or um, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Okay, so what is Faces of Literacy? Um, it is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Um, it involves student and tutor speakers, stories, music, art, when we can be in person, uh, food, celebration. It's really a time to celebrate all of you and the amazing work that you're doing together and um, you and students as you know, full people with really um, incredible stories to, to share with the community. And also builds community. So we try to bring parts of the community in the Fox Valley um, together who might not ordinarily share space. So um, inviting community artists to partner with students and tutors. Um, other corporations sponsor us and usually attend the event. So there's lots of um, neat ways that we try to build community throughout the process. Um, and I mentioned it's our biggest fundraiser of the year and it happens um, every October. So every year we have a different theme and last year was Roots and Resiliency. So this year it is um, storytelling and celebration of our dreams and passions. And we invited students and tutors to vote to choose which theme um, out of a choice of, I think five you were most interested in and that's what um, the most people selected. So that's... Um, this is just a picture from the celebration a few years, two years ago. Um, so when we were in person, um, so hopefully maybe this year, we'll see. Okay, so I'd like to open it up just for some shared brainstorming. Um, so this is a storytelling project. So throughout the year, we work on uh, crafting stories that we then share at the event in October. And I'd like to hear from you all, why um, is storytelling something that we might be interested in doing? You know, how does storytelling enrich your life? Yeah, Sky. Um, well, as a creative writing major um, in college, storytelling is one of my favorite things. Um, and I think one of the really powerful things about storytelling is it allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes in, in such an immersive way that you don't normally get to. And like whether that is someone telling you a story orally or if you are reading the story, um, it really allows you to gain new perspectives and understanding through communication, which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah, the perspectives and um, get to empathize with somebody in a way that can feel really special. Um, anyone else? I can't see all of your pictures. Um, so if you wanna just speak up, that would be great if you do wanna share. I think it also um, is a way for the, the, the person who's telling the story and the listener to think more deeply about um, the elements of their story and the elements of their life, if, if that's what we're telling our stories about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think through the process of crafting a story and then telling it, um, often our understanding changes and deepens. And yeah. Um, just like through listening, yeah. And it can give you a closer personal connection sometimes just mm -hmm. to hearing hearing about their story and their um, their experience in different settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I'm really grateful when um, I get to hear you know stories from students and tutors about what brought you here and what your goals are, and um, especially students often have stories that. Uh, I don't expect, and that's really fun to hear and get to build such deeper, broader understanding of you know, what people go through and what they have to offer. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Okay. Um, so here's uh, just a quote from the author, Philip Pullman. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, sh stories are the thing we need most in the world. Um, so I think when students, especially um, just because that's who I get to hear stories from most often, but when they tell us a story, it's really a gift and um, I get to you know, go away um, having gained so much from, from their, sh their sharing and their vulnerability. And so why stories matter? Um, if any of you have done uh, visual storytelling or visual brainstorming, um, seen it live, these are awesome. And this is a visual storyboard from a um, conference. And they talked about, you know, why do stories matter? Um, so some of the things that stand out, you know, a strong story builds broader understanding, has a human voice. Um, shows and doesn't tell, is detailed, uses plain language, so language that um, people can understand that doesn't have jargon, um, unexpected wisdom, challenges stereotypes, changes the public conversation, writing helps us to see patterns, make people feel, to act differently, build support, can be relatable, find common interest, put yourself in their shoes, <clears throat> build solidarity. Does anything here stand out to anyone um, in general or about um, what you've experienced working with students at Fox Valley Literacy? I feel for, for me, um, I've known my student for quite a few years and doing the storytelling project last year, um, I learned things that I had never known before about her and um, how she grew up and where she grew up. And I felt like we had shared a lot already, but mm -hmm. the story helped us go a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just really interesting. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. you repeat again what the uh, title of was last year's title was? Yeah, the theme last year was Roots and Resiliency. So it was okay. our 30 year anniversary last year. Um, yeah, and it seemed to fit with 2020 as well, which was a nice coincidence. <laughs> yeah. um, Especially doing it virtually, that mm -hmm. was a challenge. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, but it was good. It really helped our oral communication. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? I like the point about building support through stories because I feel like stories at Fox Valley Literacy um, help, you know, people understand where our students come from, you know, what they believe in, what their goals are, um, and it's a good way for us to build support in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when um, so many of our students have immigration backgrounds, it's, you know, something that's very politicized, and um, I think a lot of our students are used to telling a very narrow story about themselves for many reasons, and so it's um, really special that we get to at least invite um, people to share more, more creatively and broadly than they might otherwise have the opportunity to, um, to different audience. I, I think that I, that just seeing the um, barriers that you know, our students have uh, on a daily life, their little stories of, you know, what they go through with their children and husband and trying to be working and not having uh you know much say in government and that type of thing mm -hmm. um you know, those little stories uh, kind of help you feel and feel where they're coming from and actually uh i i haven't 
we ha I haven't dealt with any deep stories, which would be nice. I, it's hard to get to that point uh, with my students, but um, uh, I, every uh, little while something more comes out, which uh, mm -hmm. in a story form, which is uh, nice because it helps me understand them a little better. Yeah. Yeah, I think this project is um, can be really helpful to help students and tutors bring their relationship to a little bit different, um, you know, maybe a deeper level or just introduce a dynamic that um, maybe one or both were hesitant to introduce and ends up often being really rewarding. So I'm happy to hear that. Okay, um, this is a quote from Nick Shire, who's the founder of HeartBrain uh, Writing Workshops and Trainings, and um, they're also the previous executive director of Fox Valley Literacy. Um, so stories are essential to human connection. We all need to learn how we want to use our voices, and we all need to learn how to listen to others. Um, so that's something that we really want to invite people to explore through this process as well as um, especially students who might be using their voice in a different context than they're used to and context they're not necessarily comfortable in or um, often empowered in. Um, and then, you know, all of us who get to, to listen and if tutors, um, you're also welcome to share a story. And so that can be a really neat opportunity for your student to practice listening um, to how you use your voice and listening to your story as well. And Okay. So uh, like I just mentioned, we are happy if you're just your student wants to tell their story and you just want to support them. We're also happy if your student doesn't want to tell a story and you would like to. Um, and it's, I think, often really rewarding if both of you tell a story and work through that process together. Um, it can create a little bit more of an even dynamic between you and your student and um, helps us as teachers to learn how to teach if we're going through the process also. And uh, we really want to hear a story from your life, so not about Fox Valley literacy. Um, if you really want to tell the story about, you know, tutoring and something like that, then that's okay, but the invitation is to um, tell a story from something in your life just so that we can get to know you and um, and then aim for one page if you're writing. So it doesn't need to be long. Uh, you can do a little bit longer, but uh, we make a book at the end and it's helpful if each story is about one page. That's also hopefully a little less intimidating. Do you ask everyone to participate in this? Um, it's optional. It's just an invitation. Um, so many people won't. But you know, whoever wants to, it's wonderful. And at the end, we select some stories that we pair with artists and um, we make visual art or the artists write songs and that becomes part of our programming for the event. Um, and we can only do that with a limited number of people, but everyone who writes a story, your story goes in the book. So this year, the theme is dreams and passions. Um, so the I think terminology or the vocabulary isn't as hard as last year, so maybe <laughs> definitions aren't necessary, but um, there's some sample definitions here. And I will share uh, the recording of this and the uh, PDF of the slides. So, um, so don't I don't have to keep uh, taking pictures of these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, We're I taking notes. To mention. <laughs> yeah. Um, the in service tonight will really work as a sort of teacher's manual to show you how to use the workbook. Um, so they go hand in hand, and yeah, you don't need to take notes. So I have a video here, an example of a story. Um, that fits with the theme, the length.
my mother, she would actually make under 8,000 a year. And if she reached the 8,000, she would actually be happy that she made that much. So I would literally go outside my house, put all my products there and sell them. I didn't make much. I made, what, 20 bucks a week? But for a eight-year-old, you're a millionaire with That's that kind of money. comic books and stuff, yeah. But the thing is, I wasn't like other kids. I didn't go buy Pokemon cards. <laughs> Little money I made, I gave it to my mom. The first time I remember she was cooking and uh, I came up to her and I told her, Mom, I know you don't have money, so here's 15 bucks I made. She turned off the stove, she turned around, started crying and hugged me. From that point on, I just dedicated on getting money for my family. How did you make that money? First of all, the one thing that comes to people's mind in the bad neighborhoods is drugs, but I did not sell drugs. The reason for that is, first of all, I know it's wrong. Secondly, I picture my mom, how disappointed she'll be if she finds that out. So I actually started helping in a construction site, and this was in fifth grade. It was bad on my bones. Like I have bad shoulders, bad knees for all the stuff I was carrying. When you were younger, did you realize kind of like, hey, this isn't normal or this isn't what other people go through? Well, I always knew I was poor, but I remember one time in particular, my shoes were all scraped up. So I got paint and I painted them white. Some kid fell and tripped in front of my shoes and noticed it and he pointed out and uh, laughed. And that's when it hit me really hard. Like I'm actually poorer than I thought. How's your first semester of college been? Things are great. I just think about it, like being the first one to go to college in my whole family, over 50 of us. That's my biggest motivation. I'm really proud of you that you went this far. And I just want to have you come back in like 10 years, dressed really sharp, you know, in a nice suit, in nice <laughs> shoes, and have finally have a pair of shoes that you haven't painted. And I want you to get everything you've ever wanted. Um, so what does the story making it um, tell us about dreams or passions? Like what is the message that they want us to take away? Like when they were sitting down to tell that story, what do you think they were? Why did they choose that story? Why is it meaningful, important to tell? I think there's a focus on how much work actually goes into making it and making it can be super different for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a really like personal journey um, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty incredible yeah. childhood. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we begin to share our hearts with people, which is this storytelling thing, we begin to develop a deeper friendship with the people we're working with. Uh -huh. And I think this, this is really cool. To, and, and, you know, every time we get, get together to share a little different part of our life, a part of our story with our student, you know, when we're face to face with them, which is I, I try to do, uh -huh. um, you, you, you become a closer and closer and closer friend yeah. with your student. And I think that's incredible as the work we do, you know, uh -huh. teaching citizenship, teaching speaking English is one thing, but developing a close friendship with our students is a byproduct of this storytelling thing. Yeah, I think that's what makes tutoring so special is the relationships that develop and how rewarding they are for both people. You know, and in the story, money um, can be a thought of it as power in a, in a way. And uh, yet, uh, even though he was 10 years old, he was very willing to give the money to the family mm -hmm. versus buying himself something that he might like to have. Mm -hmm. Something that would benefit just yeah. him. He shared it with the whole family. Yeah, his motivation really came through. Um, and I think in revealing how um, how uh, poverty affected him, 
to reveal that I think really builds trust between you and the listener. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something really important for a lot of our students, I think, um, because quite often we as tutors are coming from a much more um, uh, entitled background. I think that we really need to make sure our students trust us. Yeah, there are lots of stories that might be really meaningful that um, our students might not want to share, might not want to share with us because of how vulnerable it is or how much stigma might be attached to that part of their experience. Um, so when they do, it's it's a really big gift and does show that they really trust you. So it's, but yeah. one thing about that story is, you know, it doesn't really show that much about what his dreams and passions are, but it makes us make assumptions about what we think his dreams and passions might be. Mm. Uh, and uh, 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 that's uh, part of learning also, uh, deciding whether, whether uh, you know, that is part of his dream or not, and uh, maybe going through the options. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, he, uh, he went to, on to college, but there was no, you know, previous talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And he he was poor, but he didn't say he wanted to be rich. But we mm -hmm. wanted him, to, we wanted him to be better. So we make some assumptions and learn something from that story, I guess, from that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really good point. I think. Um, he's answering maybe as a child, what were some of his dreams and passions that taking care of his mom and um, dreaming that, you know, she would have an easier time. Um, those are more directly represented than what we might be projecting onto it or his teacher maybe did a little, yeah. Um, how does the speaker connect with the audience? I think maybe by revealing things that could possibly be somewhat embarrassing or hard to share. Mm -hmm. I think we were brought in by his honesty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? I think the part where um, he talked about how his mom reacted when he when he gave her the money for the first time. I, it almost brought tears to my eyes. Um, because I, I mean, I've, I've heard of similar situations. I've had friends who have grown up in similar circumstances. And I know how hard that can be both for the children and for the parents. And I mean, it really is, they have to work so hard and it's oftentimes not their fault they're in this position in the first place. Yeah, so he's honest, he involves emotions in how he tells the story. he's probably still sending money to his mother you know? <laughs> like a lot of lot about like a lot of uh my students do you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay i'm gonna just um skip the last couple because i think we already touched on them a bit um, so Nick, uh, Nick Shire and Heartbrain helped make this workbook and then we edited it um, to work for our specific theme and project. So big thank you to them. Um, I will send all of you a PDF of the workbook and then if you want a hard copy, then we can arrange for you to pick one up in the office or maybe we can mail them. Um, so this is the front page of the workbook here. And I'm gonna talk through uh, how the workbook is set up. So it is organized into, um, it is organized into five sessions. So you could do them over five weeks so you can spread them out um, if that works better for you. And I'm gonna share some suggestions for what you would do with each session in each class. Um, so the beginning is 
questions to explore your dreams and passions. So we would invite you to talk through these five questions with your student. Um, you could maybe have them read them ahead of time and pick out you know, one or two that they're most interested in. Um, you can you know, modify that however it works for you. But this is really an opportunity to practice conversation, to practice some storytelling with your student, um, to work on vocabulary and sentence structure, but really in a conversational way. Um, so we have five different questions and a sub, some sub questions to help deepen and think about them more broadly. Um, if you have a different question in mind, or you know, if you you and your student know this is the story I want to tell, and it doesn't necessarily fit one of these five, that's fine. You can tell whatever story is really meaningful to you, but these are just um, kind of there to help you get started. And one thing I think that's really important just to stress is that um, encourage the student to ask you questions, like make it a real conversation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Often as teachers, we will do most of the talking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so that's a really good reminder. And then students want to go out in the world and they want to be able to ask questions effectively. Um, so doing that with you is a really good way to not just build that relationship, but also build those skills and confidence. Um, some of the things that you might discuss beyond the questions themselves are if there are words in your student's primary language for these ideas. Um, dreams and passions maybe is a little bit more direct than roots and resiliency, so it might not be as necessary, but um, some examples. Um, you can discuss the sample questions and teach needed vocabulary or grammar. You can tell each other's stories. There's um, example videos here. So they're the same ones I'm gonna show during the uh, webinar tonight that you can, they're linked. So if you click on this, it'll open the video and you can watch it with your student. Um, and then we would suggest that you try within the first week or two to uh, choose a story and stick to it. It doesn't need to be, you know, the perfect story or the ultimate story, just to choose something that feels manageable, but uh, meaningful and inspiring that you're excited to work with for a few weeks. Um, and you are welcome to you know, get a copy of this workbook for you and your student and to write in it or um, to you know, write in a notebook instead, however you wanna do it. So after the first um, pages, which are to be used in class, then we have a page with suggested homework. And for week one, we're suggesting you free write. Um, so just sitting down, maybe setting a timer for 10 minutes or so, um, and just writing whatever comes to mind um, that's you know, telling your story. But writing it however it comes to your mind, not worrying about uh, the form or spelling, punctuation, grammar. Um, this is just the first time getting it out. If your student is um, not a, you know, intermediate or advanced student in English and they speak a different language, they might uh, write the story in their primary language the first time. That'll help them to be able to focus on the content and the development of the story and um, not on getting stuck every couple words or you know partway through sentences on vocabulary or how do you you know say what I want to say and then they can come back to it and um, translate it into English or then free write it in English again. It'll be much easier to free write it in English if they've already done that in Spanish or their first language. Um, then it's helpful to read it out loud and to reflect, okay, what is my story about? What is, you know, what am I telling? Um, okay. And then another option is to dictate. So especially with everything being virtual right now, you might have your student um, record on their phone. You can use WhatsApp or if you both have iPhones, um, there's a voice note option um, where you can speak the story 
and that might be more accessible for some students who don't have very advanced um, written literacy, and that would be a good way to get started at least. <coughs> Any questions so far for class one or comments? Okay. Okay. So uh, session two is really setting the scene, so starting to think a little bit more critically about the important elements of the story and to develop a bit more. Um, so you might start class by you know, looking at what they wrote or sharing what you wrote. Um, you might read it out loud. It's really great if, um, say that only your student is participating and you're not writing your own story, to have them read out loud to you maybe talk about it for a while and you read it out loud to them so they can hear how um, a native English speaker would um, would tell their story so they can hear your intonation and the flow. Talk about how did it feel to write the story, you know, discuss what is your story about, what's interesting, moving or engaging, is anything unclear, um, what do you want to know more about? So these are questions that um, you can ask each other or you can ask them to reflect on their own story. And then there's some writing options here. You could also just do this as conversation. So in the workbook writing, um, where does your story begin? <clears throat> what does it look like, smell like, sound like, feel like? Where does your story end? What changes over time? And this is also an opportunity to <clears throat> do a little bit of education about um, the structure of narratives in Western culture. Excuse me. <clears throat> so not all cultures tell a story from beginning to end. Um, and not all students will have been taught in school to think about you know, having a hook and then rising action, climax, solution, maybe a call to action. So that's a helpful um, educational piece to teach them that you know, a lot of the time in mainstream storytelling or institutions, especially if they wanna go to higher education, um, knowing how to tell a story in this format is a good skill. Um, but doing that in a way where if they choose to tell it in a different format that um, we're still going to respect that, you know, maybe they want to choose a flow that is more authentic to their culture or community. <clears throat> okay, so we're exploring the narrative arc, building clarity, detail, involving the senses. Um, we also have these uh, storytelling formats that you can explore. <clears throat> so we have uh, first verbal formats. So you might free write in first person narrative and then decide, wow, it'd be really interesting to tell this story um, as a biography of my grandmother um, or as a folk tale from you know, my culture or you know, once upon a time as a fairy tale. Um, <clears throat> so you might decide to shift the format moving forward and um, into something more creative or more interesting to you. Um, so you might talk about which of those formats feels most natural or inspiring. Yeah. Heather, am I the only one here who hasn't experienced this, uh, this event before? I, I don't think so. I haven't because, um, for instance, back if you scroll down to the top of this page, um, changing the format to be um, fiction inspired by your life or mm -hmm. biography of someone important to you, does that, does that work for what you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah, story. so they might tell a story about their grandmother and how their grandmother inspired their their dreams today. Um, so it, it could be, you know, not my name is Heather and I was born, you know, here and my life progressed in this way. It doesn't need to be a, a kind of dry linear narrative about my dreams and passions in a narrow way if they would prefer to tell a story about, um, you know, 
about their life, but maybe fictionalize it as a fairy tale or as a okay. fantasy, okay. Um, that's absolutely okay. Or, yeah. Are we, are, are they going to allow the reader to see that this is a folk tale they're writing or a? Yeah, um, for stories that we don't feel are clear, in that sense, then we would invite um, a short introduction, so maybe a sentence or two. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, or staff would then propose, you know, maybe it would be helpful if we could introduce your story in this way so that people have a little bit of context. Okay. Um, yeah. You can also work that in with the student, um, you know, with your student or suggest an introduction if you think that that would be helpful. Yeah. But you don't necessarily want, um, I'm just thinking I wouldn't aim my student toward this, but the, the life that is incredible is her mother's. You don't want her, her mother's dream and dreams and hopes or passions. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay if that's the story that they would find most meaningful to tell. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially if, you know, their mom's somebody who's inspired them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll share an example from last year, and she told a story of her, her mother, um, and it's really wonderful. Okay. Um, if your student is, or you are an artist of any, so any sort, and you'd like to integrate um, visual or um, other forms of art, then you're more than welcome to do that. So we have some suggestions here. Um, I'm gonna not dwell on that so we can keep moving, but if you have questions about it, we can talk more about how that works later. Um, so then the homework is to revise or free write again, making the story richer. And if you've chosen a new format, then rewriting it in that format. And on the bottom, there's teacher's notes. So here you'd be reviewing for content, meaning, depth, and clarity, and not yet for grammar, punctuation, or spelling, unless your student requests that. And they, um, you know, there are some students who like want to be corrected and want that kind of um, editing every time, and that's okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have another example here. Oops. In this one, there's no video, it's just an audio. I remember coming back home. That was the first time I cried. We lost everything. Yep. I was in that FEMA trailer for almost three years. And I drove around the night ward. We didn't have no stores, no barbershops, no laundry room. There's nowhere for people to go buy a loaf of bread. Right. You have to catch three buses to get to a store. And I always was taught if there's a problem, somebody got to make a move. So I decided to open up a grocery store. I remember when I first bought that building, everybody thought that I was crazy. When I peeked in the door before you started working, I said, this is nothing but junk. I mean, it was trash and debris on the floor that you had to crawl over. And, and how can he make anything out of this? But... You were one of my very interesting sons. <laughs> Always jump into things you had no business doing. <laughs> it was hard. It was real, real hard. And those eight-hour days turned into 14, 15 hours a day. But what motivated me the most was seeing the people that was walking by with the groceries and seeing them get off the bus with all of those bags that made me work harder. We finally did the ribbon cutting ceremony, and that day I will never forget. You served the very snowball. first snowball, and the first customer cried because she said she never thought the Lord Night World was coming back. You saw something that I didn't see. I'm glad you you took the chance. And seeing so many people and the look on their faces is a joy. It was a headache back then, but now it's, it's, it's all worth, worth it. It was all worth it, and if it takes me to do it by myself. I'm going to put one business at a time back into the Lord Night Ward because it's home. So my 
my apologies, I forgot that one doesn't have an introduction, um, but that is about uh, Burnell and it's an interview with him and his mother and they're from New Orleans. So they're talking about moving back to New Orleans after the hurricane and finding out that um, everything had been destroyed and there aren't even any grocery stores in his neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> Um, so just for time, I don't want to have too much conversation, but um, it's really helpful to think about, you know, what was the structure of this story? Um, so they told this story as a conversation rather than a, a sim single person narration. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on what that added to the story, um, having both of them participating and Well, having the, the mom's comments um, mm -hmm. really gave that uh, outside view of, of Burnell and what mm -hmm. he was attempting to do. It was, it added humor. Yes, yeah. I didn't realize I was muted. I, I, I meant to say something very similar. <laughs> um, that like you got to see her perspective and you got a glimpse of their relationship um, as, as like a family unit and it was, that was pretty cool. That added something different. Mm -hmm. um, whose story is this? So I think it's Burnell's story. It's his mom's story. Sorry. It's the whole community's story because community it's story. about providing the grocery store, right? Yeah. So it speaks to some bigger themes of you know disaster and. Um, rebuilding who do you think their audience was like who are they speaking for isn't that a story core one mm -hmm. wasn't that a story core yeah so everybody who wants to yeah. get a little bit more depth of feeling into what the country is made up of or mm -hmm. points of view mm -hmm. It's for any listener. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. It also felt like it was for them. Um, oh. For the two of them, um, to me. Yeah. yeah, to express their appreciation for mm -hmm. each other, so that they have each other. Mm -hmm. Do they um, want the listener to learn, feel, or do anything? Do you think? What were they inviting us to? There's a problem in your community. Feel free to step up and take care of it. Mm -hmm. It might take yeah, a take lot of risk. hard work, but yeah, it's worth it. Yeah. I had my student write me a paragraph about things that happened at work this week or mm -hmm. things that happened at home this week. And then we would go through that story and work on it grammatically. Mm -hmm make sure there's little dots and commas that go above and commas that go below and mm -hmm. that go in between and and uh, how many how many subjects you can have in one sentence and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff you know but it it yeah. allowed it allowed me to work with him on on um language skills mm -hmm. um at his level and find out where he's at yeah. and then and then work on that and move on from there so it was a um a real good chance to build on his skill levels and, and uh, writing levels. So. Yeah, storytelling is a great opportunity for building some of those hard skills that our students want to develop. Yeah. And writing it down mm -hmm. before we got together was is, is a good encouragement for him to, you know, share some of these things. And it, it was a, it was a great, uh, great time together. So good. Yeah, I, I love when that's the homework. Um, okay, so session three, class, um, you might again read your stories out loud. You could read them together as well. There are some specific reading techniques. Um, if you're interested, we have materials to help you as a tutor learn how to teach reading. Um, 
and then discuss again, you know, what is your story about? How has it changed since last week? What's inspiring? What's unclear? Um, anything missing? And then we're really working on creating a connection. So some of those questions that we just discussed with Burnell's story. Um, how can you get your audience's attention? Is it through humor, emotion, um, you know, the vulnerability, other things we mentioned? And then what does your student and what do you want the listener to feel and to think and to do when reading your, hearing your story and then afterward? And then is there anything your audience might not understand about the story? Um, so I had to provide context because um, they don't start that story with a, an introduction that, you know, this is New Orleans, um, dot, dot, dot. They have a little written introduction below. So thinking about what's missing in that sense. Um, and you might come back to this. It might be a helpful um, tool at that point to the, the visual about why stories matter. Um, the homework then is to revise. Um, so focusing on the most important aspects of the story, making them clearer and richer, connecting with the audience. Um, oops. You might select, you know, maybe top three things that uh, your, you or your student could do to help improve the story, making notes, um, rewriting it. And it's important to take breaks between rewrites. So you know, don't do it back to back. Take a you know, rewrite and then take a couple days so it can settle and come back to it. And then maybe start reading the story to your friends, your family, yourself in the mirror, your dog. Session four is focused on clarity. So any words that um, the audience might not know, anything that needs to be translated. Um, it's okay if your student wants to have things in their first language, but then just providing a translation or an explanation of what that is. Um, um, You might, if you haven't started editing for grammar, uh, make sure that you're doing that at this point for grammar, punctuation, and spelling. Um, we don't necessarily want only standard, you know, formal English, but um, grammar that would at least be acceptable and understandable in informal native English speaker settings would be good. Um, it's okay if your student <coughs> wants to use colloquialisms or grammar that um, might not be you know, academic, um, but is still how people speak um, so that it's understand, understandable. Does that make sense? Okay. And these are stories that we're gonna get ready for next October, is that it? Yeah, um, but we, we start now because it takes quite a long time um, to work on the stories and gather them and then to pair them with community artists. We need the whole summer for artists to be able to work on um, songs or visual art. Um, or if your student or you want to do your own artwork, um, then that takes a while also. So um, our deadline is May 15th. Oh, really? May 15th for October? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Can you excuse me for just a second? Yeah. I'll be right back. Um, so your homework for session four is yeah. um, to share your story with two or three other people and listen to their feedback. So this is an opportunity for your student um, to maybe share with somebody they're not as comfortable with, maybe somebody who doesn't speak their native language. Um, they could, you know, share with somebody on staff if you want to practice that way, or maybe they share with um, somebody in, in a class they're taking, maybe with their family, that's fine too. Um, yeah, yeah, right now it's hard for them to share in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and ask for some feedback, you know, so what do you, what do people love? What do they want to hear more about? What isn't necessary? Um, is there anything distracting? And then edit, thinking about richness, connection with the audience, clarity, and grammar, punctuation, and spelling. 
how long should the story be in minutes when you read it out loud? Yeah. So I would aim for two to three minutes. Um, the stories that we listened to were both under three minutes um, and they're pretty rich and we get you know, a, good, a good story out of it. So they don't need to be long. Okay, and then week, um, week five is to just have a final check-in. You know, how are you feeling? Um, is there any part of your story that you're uncomfortable with or uncomfortable sharing with certain audiences? Um, sometimes students will share stories, well, especially students, but not exclusively, will share stories that are quite vulnerable. And, um, you know, they're welcome to, to do that if they want to talk about, you know, hardships or trauma, that's absolutely fine. We're not censoring that, but we also um, just want to make sure that they're comfortable with, you know, with staff reading it and it going in a book and it being public. Um, so maybe checking in and seeing, okay, is, do you for sure want to share this story? And if not, if you went through the whole process and then at the end they decide, actually, I don't, I just want to keep it for us. Um, that's okay. I mean, we're, we'll be sad, but that's, you know, their choice as well. So we want to respect that. Um, and in the booklet, you only used first names also. Yes. You don't include yes. last names. Yeah, we don't include any last names. Um, and if we invite people to participate in the live program, then um, we invite them to introduce themselves so they can decide how they want to do that. Um, So if you write a story, um, then the last step is to email it to Brini by May 15th. Um, here's a little bonus to practice telling your story to lots of different people. Stories get better each time it's told. Um, people, plants, animals, water, <laughs> get creative. Okay. And then I, if you have to leave exactly at seven, that is fine. I'm gonna go just a couple minutes over because I really wanna share. Um, this is a story that Yoke, one of our students wrote about her mother um, for our program last year. And she illustrated it. And then Brianne did an amazing job putting all of um, Yoke, a recording of her telling her story um, with her pictures and Brini put it all together into a video with music and um, pictures from Yoke's family as well. So this is an example of what we create with your student's story um, for the program in October. Bunsip's journey. If living is like a journey, having a goal is like setting a destination for your ship in a vast ocean. To reach your destination, you need money to purchase necessary equipment and supplies. You need effort to achieve the goal, and sometimes luck is involved. The more you have these things, the easier your journey will be. Today, I would like to tell the story of my mother's journey. Her ship was not equipped to support her, so she had to rely on diligence, determination, and luck in order to achieve her goals. At the time, schools in a small rural city in Thailand where she lived offered classes until grade 4. Only rich people could afford the fees for more education. Quitting school at grade 4 to work was normal for poor people in those days. Her mother did not want Bootsip to study further. She wanted her daughter to work and make money for the family like other kids her age. An obedient girl like Bunsu would have done what her mother wanted if her stepfather had not objected. He wanted Bunsu to continue her studies. He said, We do not have any legacy for her. We should encourage her to have knowledge so that she will not have a difficult time when she grows up. Luckily, in the year that Bunsu finished grade 4, her school extended classes to grade 7, and they needed to find students to fill the extended classes. They offered scholarships for students with good grades. This allowed Bunsu to study until grade 7. 
Her dream was to become a nurse, which made her intend to learn in high school. But there were no scholarships for her anymore in high school. Her mother wanted her to quit again, but Bung Su did not want to. She wanted to have a higher education, so she could have a good job and a better life. Her stepfather also supported her desire to continue studying. She worked very hard washing clothes and collecting soybeans to make enough money for her education, but it was never enough for her to eat properly. Some days at lunchtime, she read books in the school's library so that she could forget she was hungry. Because of working too hard, she did not get enough nutrition. She became very skinny, and her grades suffered. Her friend, who was close to a teacher, told the teacher how poor Bunsu was. As a result, she received a scholarship until grade 12. This is just a small part of Bunsu's journey, but it taught me many things about my mother. I respect how she had to overcome difficulties through tolerance, patience, assiduousness, and determination in order to achieve her goals. Even though she did not become a nurse as she had wanted, her goal for a better life was a success. She worked as a teacher for 30 years. I know how much my mother loved her job and loved to teach her students. Her story makes me realize how lucky I am. On my journey's trip, I have more equipment than my mother had to help me. If my mother could reach the goal, even though her ship was not well equipped, I should be able to reach my goal with effort and willingness. Another thing I learned from her story is that setbacks, no matter how bad, might take me to a better destination. I hope this story can give some encouragement to people who experience struggles as they follow their goals. To those who have to switch paths because of circumstances, I say, never, never give up on your dreams. So that was one of our students um, and the story that she wrote and illustrated um, for us last year. So I think it's a really good example of uh, what our students can do with some help from their, from their tutors um, and what the community can do when we come together. Um, and it really demonstrates a lot of the, the things that we've talked about, you know, the, um, you can tell somebody else's story who's important and still share a lot about you know, her as an individual, even though she's telling her mother's story, you get to know her in the process. And um, a lot of the, the themes that we talked about as far as emotion and um, the construction of the stories, you know, if this is something you wanna share with your student, it's a really good tool to help them think about how they wanna tell their own story or what kind of story they'd like to share. Any comments or questions? These are stories just for students, right? Um, well, we focus on students, but the invitation is that, you know, you as a tutor, if you wanna tell a story as well, um, then we love that. And we will include your story uh, next to your students in our book. Um, and I, for, for prizes for the best story? Uh, no. For <laughs> No, no prizes. <laughs> oh, Ten times your salary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, my student and I both wrote stories, and I think it was really valuable. I wasn't sure how she would respond. It gave her a lot of opportunity to ask me questions, mm -hmm. and um, I, I found it very valuable to for both of us to do stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a lot of work, but it's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we did have, um, I think, one or two pairs who did their story kind of like the story core stories where they both participated and told one story together. Um, you know, not everyone will be able to do that. You have to have a bit longer relationship with your student, but unless you're really creative and both talk about, you know, your mother or gardening or something that you share in common, but yeah. Um, so we have a YouTube page with um, all of the student stories that we made into videos last year that were part of the program. So Stephanie, um, we had a, pro a professional videographer who volunteered to make a video with her. So um, it's five minutes long, really great. Um, and then we've got some songs from local musicians who read student stories and then wrote songs based on the story. Um, and that was really, really meaningful for students to be able to work with a community artist in that way. Um, and then uh, Raj is just one of our students. He didn't write a story, but he um, made a video for us, Boon Sib's journey, the one we saw. And then um, if you wanna see a little snippet of everyone's um, story, you can watch this last one here. Um, and if you're interested, we have books from last year. Um, we are charging for them as part of our fundraising, but um, they are very cool, I think. Um, so you can buy one there. There's a link to StoryCorps if you want to see some more examples of stories. Um, and then we have a new web page, a new website, I mean. Brainy did an amazing job um, creating a new website for us. And we will have a Faces of Literacy page here soon. So check back in February and we'll have more resources and Faces of Literacy information. But if you haven't already checked out the new website. Sorry. I'm sorry. Who created this? Brianne, one, one of our staff members. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, she, uh, they did an amazing job. And um, a lot of it can be translated into Spanish, French, Swahili, or Mandarin. And those are the languages that we have staff um, who speak. So. OK, that's all I have. Thank you for letting me go over a few minutes. <laughs> um, I, any questions? A lot of information there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Process that a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will share the recording and the uh, PDF of the slides that we went through tonight and a PDF of the workbook with, um, with you and all tutors. Um, but if you have any questions, Mariana and I are available. Um, I won't be available till mid-February, but after that, um, and we can help you and your student. Um, please participate if you want to. It's really rewarding. And yeah, so thank you And watch all. the videos on YouTube. They're really yes. good. Yeah, they're so yeah. good. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing all this information with us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here and have a nice weekend and we'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you a question?